Hi, I'm Tom D, professor at Stanford University and research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Thanks for joining me for a discussion of the revealed preferences for school reopenings, evidence from public school disenrollment. This is research done jointly with uh, Elizabeth Huffaker, Cheryl Phillips, and Eric Sagara here at Stanford. The context for this research is the difficult set of choices parents and educators faced in the summer of 2020 after having struggled through the school year that had been disrupted in the previous March by the COVID pandemic. As they looked ahead to fall 2020, uh, parents and educators had to decide how would they offer schooling? Would it be uh, in a remote only setting, a traditional in-person format, or some hybrid of the two. And this is a choice that had to reckon with really serious and uncertain trade-offs across, across health, educational, and economic outcomes. In particular, in-person instruction could imply health risks to the child, the child's family, as well as the broader community at a time when the availability and efficacy of vaccines was really uncertain. They weren't yet available then. But to go remote only also implied very clear risks of developmental harm to kids, both in terms of their learning outcomes and, and social emotional outcomes, and also potentially serious economic disruption to households. So what happened? Well, most public school students experienced remote only instruction, nearly two thirds, while 24% were in person and the residual were in some kind of hybrid format. The research question our team took up is what were the comparative effects of these instructional modes on district enrollment? Now, let me pause to suggest why this matters. In part, it's because it provides clear and objective evidence on the revealed preferences of parents who could vote with their feet in response to a district's choice. Would they decide to send their child to that school as a function of the instructional mode being offered by the school? But also these enrollment changes really matter because they provide leading evidence of the educational disruption created by the pandemic and by the, our policy choices in response to that. Now to contextualize that, let me talk a little bit about what we've been learning uh, uh, in terms of the impact of the pandemic on learner outcomes. Clearly, these have been historically unprecedented learning disruptions. And we see that in terms of key process measures, reports of reduced learning time, students being exposed to less academic content, and less engagement with their teachers and their peers. Now, in terms of documenting of effects on learning, we're, researchers have been trying to do that, but in a sense, we're relying on a broken compass because the typical state tests, the assessments we would use to measure student performance have been canceled. And many of the more informal interim assessments districts would field have been suspended. And the ones that have been given are done under different testing circumstances, remotely instead of in person, and often with lower test participation. So there are a number of serious qualifications there. But despite these qualifications, there seems to be a consensus growing from the available data that suggests a troubling portrait uh, with important implications for economic growth and inequality. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, the emerging evidence suggests student learning is several months behind what we would expect based on uh, pre-pandemic patterns, particularly in math. And interestingly and importantly, these patterns seem to have a kind of K-shaped trajectory that resembles the character of the economic recovery, in particular with bigger losses in learning among economically disadvantaged students as well as Black and Hispanic students. And uh, a number of experts have argued that the selection by biases are such that this low participation may lead us to actually understate uh, the degree of learning losses. But I also want to be clear about one other caveat. Most of the testing is in grades three through eight. We still know relatively little about changes in learning among younger students in early elementary grades and among high school students. I also want to underscore there's important but fragmentary evidence about how the pandemic has influenced social emotional well-being among American youth. Uh, certainly parents and teachers are reporting higher levels of stress. Teacher surveys suggest they observe lower levels of engagement among their students. And adolescents and teens themselves are reporting increased difficulty in concentrating in making decisions and just generally feeling happy. And these pejorative outcomes seem to be more severe in remote settings and for students in those settings. 
for longer periods of time. Now, much of this evidence relies on subjective survey responses, but there's also some more objective evidence, in particular, scattered reports of sharply increased chronic absenteeism, particularly for students in virtual settings. Okay, so this sets the stage for why we think public school enrollment is an important leading indicator. It's objectively captured, it's universally available for all public schools, and it's available quickly. In a sense, it's like a canary in a coal mine for figuring out what's going on in American schools. And we know there's clear evidence that public school enrollment fell dramatically in fall 2020. It's worth pausing to think about what, in what sense does that reflect educational disruption? Well, these enrollment declines are going to be, uh, in part, reflect reactive switches of students to private and homeschooling options, some truancy and dropping out of school, critically, some skipping or delaying kindergarten. And that's important because we know those early formal educational experiences have substantial long run outcomes and many kids are missing or delaying those critical developmental experiences. And then finally, to the extent these kids may never return in full numbers to public schools, that's going to imply a longer term fiscal threat to those institutions. So what are the major patterns in public school disenrollment? Well, uh, working with some colleagues, data journalists at the New York Times and elsewhere, uh, we recently put together a, a comprehensive set of data on uh, fall 2020 enrollment at the school and district level. And in particular, we did this because the typical federal reporting we rely on is done with such a lag. We made the effort to go to all the states we could and collect and harmonize all the data we could. And at the aggregate level, we saw uh, K through 12 schooling uh, fell by roughly 2.2%, a loss of over a million students. And this was in the New York Times just a few weeks ago, as you can see from the picture. Um, digging deeper, these declines were particularly sharp in kindergarten, where, where we saw roughly a 9% drop in enrollment, and to a lesser extent in early grades, where there was a 3 to 4% uh, drop in enrollment. And we see small, you know, uh, less evidence of disenrollment at higher grades. Interestingly, the kindergarten reductions were larger and poorer in urban communities and also in districts that offered remote schooling. But the key confirmatory question we take up in our research is, did the choice of remote only instruction really contribute to this disenrollment? So how did we get after that question? Well, we built a district by year panel data set going back to fall six years to fall 2015 through fall 2020 and examined the impact of the district choice of instructional mode, uh, in-person, hybrid, or remote only on fall 2020 enrollment. To do this, we relied on uh, audit data collected by a company called Burbio uh, that surveys over a thousand school districts uh, and, and tracks their instructional mode over time. And in particular, their sampling strategy oversamples the largest districts. So this sample covers nearly half of all public school students in the US. We match that to this district year profile of enrollment data from our federal and state sources and also matched it to district by year controls for other COVID related outcomes that were likely to influence uh, enrollment patterns the degree of COVID risk in the community, and other policy restrictions that were in place around workplaces, public events, and public transportation. The main finding is straightforward. The decision to offer remote-only instruction contributed significantly to public school disenrollment, and we don't find clear evidence that hybrid instruction uh, had an effect. So let me show you this visually with a, you know, a straightforward, somewhat dynamic graph. Uh, let's begin in fall 2015 and divide that sample of districts among those that chose remote only in fall 2020, those that chose hybrid, and those that chose it in person. And let's go forward and see how, examine their comparative enrollment trends as we go to 2016, 2017, 2018, and then 2019. Uh, the eve of the pandemic, the last year before the pandemic, we see an interesting pattern has already emerged. The districts that will eventually choose in-person enrollment are seeing comparative enrollment growth, that, that's the top line in the graph, while the dark bottom line, the ones that are going to choose remote only 
one year later are seeing comparative enrollment declines. And what's going on here is that the remote only districts are, tend to be more urban and have a long run historical trend towards reduced enrollment. If our analysis didn't reckon with this, we would overstate the impact of remote only instruction. So we adopt several complementary methodological approaches to eff effectively control for this pre-existing trend so it's not a source of bias. Okay, let's go to the focal fall 2020 enrollment outcome. What do we see? Well, first of all, all three types of school districts saw substantial declines in enrollment, but the declines in the districts that chose remote only were comparatively large in, in these conditional means by roughly 1.3 percentage points. Now, so if we net out the fact that they probably would have lost enrollment, relative enrollment by that half a percentage point, this implies that the impact of remote only instruction is close to one percentage point. And in fact, when we turn to our preferred estimates, that's what we find. Uh, in particular, remote-only instruction appeared to reduce district enrollment by roughly 1.1 percentage points. Now, now, to place this in some perspective, our regression estimates suggest that in the in-person districts, they saw uh, all other things being equal, a decline of roughly 2.6%. This implies that the decision to go remote increased that disenrollment from 26 to 3.7%. So that's a 42% increase in the degree of disenrollment. And given the number of districts that made this decision and the overall loss of roughly 1.1 million students, we estimate that the decision to go remote uh, drove roughly 300,000 students from U.S. public schools. And there was heterogeneity in this effect. The negative effects of remote-only instruction were particularly large at the kindergarten level and to a lesser extent the elementary school level. And that's not entirely surprising, you know, because for the youngest students, there was elevated concern about whether they could learn and be comfortable in a remote-only uh, learning environment. And, and also simultaneously less concern about the health risks for the youngest kids of being uh, in person. Interestingly, we don't find consistent evidence that there were any effects of these instructional modes on enrollment at the middle or high school level. So the broad finding here is that the choice of instructional mode appears to have contributed significantly to the varied educational effects of the pandemic associated with, with disrupting schooling, withdrawing from schooling, going to new environments. So I want to conclude with just a little bit of a broader discussion about where we go from here and what are some of the key unanswered questions. Right now, we're in a situation where uh, you know, vaccination rates are lower than many would like, as, and there's inconsistent use of masking. And that implies we continue to confront some of the difficult trade-offs we faced last summer currently. Um, in terms of, of uh, you know, other unanswered questions, one of the big ones in my mind has to do with the prevalence of unschooled students. In states where we know not just public school enrollment, but we could track kids through private schooling and homeschooling and out-of-state mobility, there's a big residual of unexplained enrollment loss that suggests maybe nearly as many as one in five students are truant or have dropped out or in unregulated homeschooling environments. The federal government has, over the last decade or so, has made big investments in state longitudinal data systems for students, um, as well as there's a recent infusion of federal cash. So there may be a nice opportunity to combine those and use these new data systems to really track some of our most educationally vulnerable students who may not have any formal experience with schooling right now. Second big question is, we saw this big drop in kindergarten enrollment last year. Where are those kids showing up right now? Are they going to skip kindergarten to a large extent and show up as first graders? If they do, that's gonna present a particular teaching and learning challenge because it'll be their first experience with a more formal schooling environment. So teachers and ed educators are going to confront um, some very unique readiness to learn challenges. Alternatively, if those students uh, decide to go to kindergarten this year, they would be what I've been calling COVID redshirters. Uh, this kindergarten cohort is going to be unusually large. And we know larger class sizes at this age can be particularly harmful to child development. So in the absence of responsive staff, staffing, kindergarten crowding is gonna create 
um, challenges, and that might follow these kids through their educational trajectories. Even into college, there's some evidence that people uh, who are in uh, students who are in unusually large cohorts find that the supply of seats in college is not fully elastic and it can be more difficult to, to matriculate at college because you're in an unusually large cohort. So there's some real challenges if that ends up being the pattern as well. And then finally, I'll, I'll conclude with a broader question, which is we're seeing serious disruption to the developmental trajectories of our nation's youth. What can we do in response to that? And so um, I'm seeing thoughtful discussions of variety of options that aren't mutually exclusive. Tutoring, uh, social emotional supports, um, expanded summer learning opportunities, and then trying to leverage the education technology that might in particular meet the uh, declines in math achievement we're seeing. So these are all things I think uh, we should be continuing to discuss and study as we come to understand the challenges we're facing. Thanks for joining me.